welcome. Um, <laughs> for being here. Uh, for those of you who don't know me yet, um, my name is Melanie Crater. I'm the Director of Visual Arts here at Guild Hall. I started here last May. Um, and I uh, just want to thank you again for being here. And I do have a few more thanks for, to, to extend to people. First, to the Guild Hall staff for always making these wonderful programs. <laughs> To Andrea Grover, our executive director, and our board chair, Marty Cohen, and, and our board for champion artist. To Anthony Madonna for being an amazing program partner. And to Linda for being here today. Thank you. <laughs> a little bit about the exhibition before we move into Linda's talk. So this exhibition was um, uh, conceived in anticipation of our reopening of the John Drew Theater. That will open this July and it is the culmination of our two-year facility-wide renovation project. So we're very excited about it and so please look out for all of the amazing things we're going to have this summer. And what I wanted to do with this exhibition is look for a way to connect both the museum space and the theater space. As a nod to the multidisciplinary aspect of Guild Hall, and at the same time celebrate artists. So what happened was when I started looking through the collection, I, I noticed there was large holdings of two portfolios, the John Jonas Gruen and then the Bernard Godfrey's. And there were so many performing artists, literary artists, and visual artists in those two portfolios. And I started looking around and expanding that. And it started, the, we have some early photographs that aren't represented in here, but this show starts with the 1930s. And our collection pretty much stops at the 80s and early 90s. We have a few in the 90s. And so, again, talking with Anthony, my program partner, um, he mentioned Linda and Lori, and I already knew about Mark Mann's project, and it just so happened that I had studio visits already scheduled with Linda and Lori. So it was very, very serendipitous that Linda is part of this exhibition, um, and, and we're so happy to have her part of the exhibition. And it was really to bring, um, you know, the, the addition of Linda's works, Mark's works, and Lori's works were to bring it up to today, you know, the current time. So, and again, celebrate the theater and uh, the museum. So a little bit about Linda. Linda was born in Long Beach, New York, and she is part of, she's lived here for approximately 30 years in the area. She's part of the uh, collection of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, Guild Hall, and the Parish Art Museum. She's had numerous exhibitions here uh, one in, in the area, but one was in 2005, which was a result of her being named the top honors winner of the Artist Members Exhibition. So she had a solo sh show here at Guild Hall. And um, so anyway, we're very happy. She's also in the collection. This work is in the collection at Chuck. And um, she most recently had a solo presentation of her Mylar series at Mana Contemporary in New Jersey. So before we start with Linda, the conversation, I do want to share with you my experience of visiting Linda's studio, which I think is very telling. So um, I had my studio visit scheduled with Linda, and she called me and she said, I just want to let you know I'm going to make you lunch. You know, a, <laughs> you're a working person, you, ha you have to, you know, you're coming over at lunchtime and, and you have to eat. So um, we, I entered, uh, you know, arrived at her home and studio and she welcomed me in. We sat down, we had lunch, we had a great conversation. And then she ushered me into the next space and she said, she brought my coffee and brought my toast and she put it down and she said, you just sit there, I'm gonna take care of everything. And then she started, started showing me her photographs. And I think what was really fun about, well, what was interesting about it, it was a very endearing experience she, uh, it was very disarming, and, um, and I was completely relaxed. She, I felt <laughs> taken care of, and we had so much fun. 
And that's a, I think that's a great segue into talking about the fact that uh, Linda is also a registered nurse. And I wanted to ask you, how do you, which, which you know, made, made this make sense to me, like how, you know, she was so caring and nurturing, but I wanted to ask you if you could talk a little bit about that and how that has influenced your photography. Well, I, I, I don't, I guess I had to look at people very closely, you know, all the time, you know, and, um, and it's sort of energetically closely too, you know, it wasn't just looking at their face. So after a while, I got to know these people and got closer to them. So it wasn't like I pursued any of these people because of who they were. And um, some of these people I was involved with as a nurse. And, but I was also, I was really, each one of these people saw that I was able to photograph in the way that I wanted to photograph and they trusted me to photograph them. And they also, they had large egos some of the people, and they saw that I was a serious photographer, yet I was a nurse. So my ego was kind of down being in a subservient role, you know? And I was very serious as an artist and as an art photographer. So some of these people, I had, I had relationships with. You know, I had relationships with where I, when I finally wanted to photograph them, they were done because I knew them and I just had to photograph them. Except maybe John Sh Julian Schnabel. He wasn't somebody that I was, you know, intimately friendly with. But I thought that I had captured something about Julian in his bathrobe that I had known enough about. So I think I just, I'm able to, when I want to photograph somebody, it's because I, I just want to photograph them or I want to paint them. And maybe it is the nursing, you know, but even when I was young, I was like that. Well, I do feel like it is the disarming aspect of, you know, how you can connect with someone so um, quickly and through like deep, um, looking and observing and uh, so that's that's how I feel about it that you you're able to capture a sensibility because of that caring aspect but you've also talked about how you know you've approached people just not, strangers and they often say yes to allowing you to photograph them so do you want to talk about that a little bit Th that I always try to respect as a creative license because I've been in some pretty scary places that I've actually wanted to photograph those people where I've walked up to them and said, may I take your photograph? Never really a paparazzi. Now more with my cell phone, but I don't, I'm usually with a Roloflex, so it's very mechanical. So I'm, tr I'm usually making a connection with that person. Like I want to photograph you. And the more I know you, the more I know your essence. So, you know, I was, I was also, I had some pretty tough cookies around me telling me, don't photograph for a living, you know. Once you start photographing for a living, then I would lose my edge because nobody likes the way they look. Nobody likes the way they look, you know. They say, oh God, I might, you know, I, I, my hair, I look, I look so this and that. But I, I always liked that side of that person, and that's why I wanted to photograph them. I never saw the sides that we all pull ourselves apart for, or we nitpick about our face. And when I look at all of you in here, I was like, I want to photograph <laughs> There's a few people. Anyway, that's, yeah. So you often work in series. So there's, you have a series of children, you have a Mylar series, you have a water series. So can you talk specifically about this portrait of Chuck, which started 
an entire series of water, your water series. Before I photographed the, the, the water series, actually El Sorio was in the water in the bathtub, but I, did, I started photographing people very close up. Then, uh, uh, then another artist showed me a piece of mylar let you get in the fun house. So I went to Canal Street and I bought different weights of mills of mylar and I push pinned them up everywhere. John Chamberlain came to town and I had some relationship with him and he loved the mylar series. So he said, if you photograph people with mylar, he said, push pin it up, photograph them and get it down as fast as possible. You know, like, don't make a big issue about it. So, sure enough, John came to town. I helped him get an apartment in Sag Harbor. Then had to go see a psychiatrist for being involved with him. <laughs> oh, he was quite an interesting character. Wonderful artist, but mm, I wasn't strong enough. But John, John loved the Mylar series. John loved the Mylar series, and after that, I went around and, and to all different artists, gallerists, I just said I'd like to photograph you all in a reflective Mylar series. It was my next way of paintbrushing, of just taking a straight photograph. I loved how I could see different fractions of people's faces. I think at the time, maybe I was fractured because it was very natural for me to photograph in mylar. After mylar, I went to water, because what happens with water, it turns into mylar. You drop a stone in it, you see a reflection. So one day, I was walking into Chuck's house, four o'clock, and Chuck is in a swimming pool, and the filter is off, and he's lying there on his back by himself, nobody's around, and I said, Chuck, you can't believe what your face looks like. You have a mask around your face. He said, would you have your camera? I said, as a matter of fact, I do. I went out to my car. I had the Roloflex, which I don't always carry, ran out there and did three photographs of Chuck, of Chuck floating, and he loved him. And I went to visit his studio about two years ago while they were cleaning it all up and sure enough that photograph was hanging up over the piano so the the fam the family liked it hopefully the museum of modern art will like it <laughs> we like it <laughs> yeah I, i'm happy he would be happy to be here well why don't we move to Osorio because you did have a, a long relationship with Osorio and you have a lot of wonderful photographs of them. Two are represented here, there's many more. Um, so do you want to talk about Osorio? Osorio was the most interesting person. I mean, it was 65 acres of evergreens and conifers. I was so privileged being, again, I was hired. but. I was young, I was beautiful, I never wore, I was always in blue jeans, I was running, and there was 65 acres of conifers, and I had to get Alfonso Osorio back together. His chest was split open, you know, it was just, I knew I was in an amazing house and an amazing studio. There was no computers. I had a 35 millimeter, there was conifers, evergreens. I didn't know one tree from the next. I asked him which one was the Christmas tree on the property. He walked back into the kitchen and turned to his partner, Ted Dragon, and said, what an idiot. <laughs> she asked me which one was the Christmas tree. <laughs> By the end of my time with Osorio, he died. I gave a tour to the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens because I was, I, he taught me every tree, not the Latin names, but I, he taught me the trees, which I have that collection too. It's beautiful. It was a real gift to work with Osorio, one of my favorite places, and he had the best wine collection on the East End, which I think the American Hotel got a lot of it. Yeah, he taught me Bordeaux. <laughs> but. 
most brilliant man. Just look at his book collection. He was gentle, wonderful, temperamental. I mean, imagine, I think I was the first woman to ever be in that house, besides all his parties. And remember when Jackson Pollock crashed his car? He was on his way to the Osorio party. And one of the women didn't want to go, and he turned around. So there's always this history. You know, I'm giving you little tidbits of my life over there, but the nature I experienced, it, it's beyond. It's not about a famous person. I mean, each one of these people put me under their wing. It was, you know. So with Osorio, there were The lots bathtub, I walked in and Alfonso loved the bathtub. I didn't really ever touch Alfonso in any kind of caretaking, but he loved a bathtub. And he knew I was a photographer, quote RN. I said, yeah, I, said I want to photograph you. Yep. Again, I was very fortunate. Everybody trusted me. So you also encountered a lot of other artists at his space that are not represented here, but did you want to talk a little bit about? About? Other, the other artists that you would have encountered there? At, at, at the at Creeks? Osorio's, yeah. You know what, then that wasn't like that. It wasn't, because at the end, I only was with Osorio the last two and a half years of his life, so a lot of different artists weren't coming over there. I met Robert Miller from Robert Miller Gallery. Met him, went right over to his barn and mylared him. <laughs> Somehow they all trusted me. But it wasn't to manipulate and make people look distorted. And it was their portraits being done. Um, I didn't meet, I don't, you know. No? No. No, okay. I mean, it was a different, it was at the end. Robert Atkins from Robert Atkins Diet was good friends with Osorio. He was gonna hire me. I kept telling Alfonso to go on that diet. I said, go on the low carb diet. Robert Atkins is calling again. And then Robert Atkins said, I want to hire you. And I said, I can't. You know. <laughs> well, it's true. There's so many stories I can't even tell you. I had so much fun at the Creeks. So much fun. You know? And then there's also the story of Ted Dragon, you know, the famous story of Ted out here. So we won't get into that. Stephen Gaines' book. Well, I, she did show me her uh, photographs of the of all the trees. It's quite it's quite amazing. It's very um, beautiful, and so hopefully there's somewhere that'll show it at some point. Right. And that was my job. Once we got Alfonso together, he put me on a golf cart. That was it. We go off, and he t taught me every tree in the garden. It was magnificent. And then at the end, it was like, okay, I knew what a cryptomeria was, I knew what a blue spruce was, not the Latin names. And then Osorio left and died, which was sad. He was a sad one to die. Anyway, so next. Can we go to Dan yeah. Flavin? Oh, now Dan Flavin. Brilliant, brilliant artist. Really fortunate to be with him. Um, yeah. I, I, um, there. That was that was Dan's room, surrounded by the most beautiful, elegant art books and dogs. Um, just you know, he liked whippets. I, I don't know what to say, but the fact Dan was difficult with me, and yet he let me set up a tripod and he let me photograph him. But he would never admit that he trusted me, but he did. So we're trying to get these photographs into um, Manic Contemporary, which is the permanent collection, which also he has a room like he does in the Bridgehampton. Um, he has a museum in Bridgehampton, so if you've never seen that, but if you ever go to Jersey City, which are certain artists in this room that would love the room, the building, Jamie Dimon's gonna organize a car and we're all gonna go. <laughs> <laughs> 
um, the, you know, there's a permanent installation of, of uh, John Chamberlain up. You walk in, there's huge sculptures, and there's a Flavin room. My, my show is over, but we'll see what happens with the photographs that are up there. It was a great show. It's a great building to go visit, because some of you artists might be able to have a show there. Um, anyway, Dan and Mabel D'Amico, she's, you know, yeah, Mabel, you know. So it, it, this is like a very interesting wall for me because it's, like it's like a family photo album again, you know. They're not my family, you know, they're not my family, but it, it, it is because they were all connected. Flavin was connected when I was connected with John. Um, um, so, and they all, you can see they all trusted me. We were all, it was, I photographed them in an intimate way. Mabel, well, the story of Mabel going out to Lazy Point, if you haven't been out to Lazy Point to visit the D'Amico house, and that's a house to go visit. And I was fortunate enough to know Mabel, not nursing, I was friends and still am. And um, her husband started the art barge. So I used to go over there for dinner and was instructed not to tell people where Lazy Point was because we didn't want all these people out there. There were windsurfers now, you know? And it was like, we, and it, that, the, sh the sweater she made, everything is handmade objects, the house is sensational and she was my friend. And yes, at the very end, I did help a little bit with her death, but not very much. It was, it's incredible, every one of these people. Klaus Curtis, um, Guildhall picked Klaus Curtis, at, he, one of the greatest cur curators in America that we've ever had. I was fortunate enough to mylar Klaus and Billy and Billy was his partner at the time. Again, went over to their house, put up Mylar, photographed them. Come on in, Linda. It was like I was on a, I was on a board. I was just, everybody opened their doors because I was sincerely wanted to do portraits of all these people. And again, I had everybody in the background always was gossiping about this one and that one, so I always knew like who, which artist was happening and which was, wasn't, but I had to stay in the background. And Klaus, I did one normal shot of him, but he's in the Mylar series. Jake, young Jake, had a show here, so I think when Guild Hall was going through a lot of my photographs, they didn't want to see half-dead people everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so it's true. I love photographing children. I love, I, the children are very, there's a whole children's series. Um, and Jake was on the beach with his mother, and I knew the whole Patterson family growing up. You know, um, the, all four kids and the mother. I ended up going to New Zealand with them. And um, now Jake had a big show here at Guild Hall. He's a terrific artist. And, um, you know, I love the family. Again, this is family. But I think they would all be happy to be up here. I think they would, every one of them. How many are alive here? Um, Jake. Jake. <laughs> Julian. Julian. Snobble. Snobble. Oh, oh, Schnabel, I actually, I love this one of him because he's got his bathrobe on and I went out to the studio and he has an outdoor studio and it all happened accidentally and I just did it quickly and then I ran into him at a gallery at Duck Creek and I told him about it and he was like, I want those photographs. And he also loved the actor that was in it. And when he saw them, he pursued him and he bought the photographs. And I, they were larger, so. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Julian will have a show this summer. So. And Julian's having a sh show. I mean, we also picked, you know, uh, Jake because he had a show here, and, and uh, Julian's going to have a show this summer. So we were trying to make some connections, Linda. <laughs> um, so I want to ask you what you're working on at the moment. I'm painting a lot. 
I'm painting a lot, but I've got my camera again on me. You know, I don't carry my camera everywhere, but I'm seeing things now that I want to photograph. You know, so instead of not having it on me, I, it's not, I haven't, you know, the other day I was at a hospital and I saw somebody there that just was like, no, don't do it, don't, don't ask them. <laughs> so I, I don't know, you know, there's things that are cooking. But I'm painting a lot with photographs and flowers and not, flower, not photographs on top of paintings, but I'm enjoying that. So you brought up something just now that you, you can tell when someone's like, no, don't photograph me. Yeah, like if somebody you. doesn't want to be photographed by me, no. And if I accidentally, you know, now we have a cell phone so you get photographed and you look terrible. And, but if I have my Rolleiflex, I always ask you, may, may I photograph you? Because it's with intention. I'm intentionally pursuing that I want to photograph you, you know. And you have one more series, right? You want to talk about the new series that you're working on, or no? What's new series is that? Yeah, the nurse series. No? Oh yeah. So I always wanted to get. The, I have a, a. Well, I can't say who it is, but we. I have somebody that I'm working with now, and before the pandemic, I wanted to get it out of my system, and I used to tell Chuck all the time years ago, I want to do a nurses book. I want to photograph nurses. You know, I want to interview nurses and really hear what they have to say. Probably they're not going to tell the truth anyway. But they'll talk about what it's like to be a nurse, you know. And we started, and I started the series again. I, felt, I interviewed 30 nurses before the pandemic. Pandemic broke out. Everybody was freaked out, ran the other direction. And now I, we started it again, and I have another nursing person who I'm working with who is... I like her, her politics on nursing. So we're going to see what we can do down the line. Before we move to questions, is there anything else you want to share? That's it. <laughs> That's it. So we do have time for a few questions for Linda. Does anybody have a few questions? Anybody have any questions? Sorry. Go ahead. Sarah. Yay, yeah, Sarah. Sarah. Um, you, you've been photographing individuals in quite a tense situation. Yes. Um, how, how are you, I mean, your nursing situation, your nursing series is also about kind of intense situations. Um, is your painting a little bit more, perhaps quiet is the wrong word, but is it more Personal and less kind of. Um, sorry, I'm grasping at words. And, um, but it, I, I'm interested in this balance between your painting, which does seem to respond to situations, versus your painting, which seems very personal. Yeah, I mean, I think my painting is just as personal as my photographs. Some people are looking at my paintings like mylar. Like, they're looking at that in there when I've showed them to certain people. You know, I'm not formally trained as a painter. When I was younger, I painted in kindergarten, and I was taken out of school, out of a private school. And then I was around painters, so I watched a lot of mixing of paint, but I didn't get to really practice it. But I love painting. I, I, I think it's just another form. I, I'm not going to give up the camera, though. You know, I'm definitely not giving up the camera. Anybody else want to ask me a question? Yeah. This is a segue. Um, yes. How, uh, can you talk a little bit about what, what drew you to photography? And you, so you talked about you know, being exposed to painting, and so there's some attraction to the creative process, but how did you make that transition then to photography and, and then to a, a real commitment as an artist in photography? It's a great question because I don't, I, you know, I lived very different lives, <laughs> you know, I, even when I was nursing, I lived out in California, I, I lived, I think it was a real way to, for me to express myself. When I was younger, I, it's kind of hard to believe because I do like to talk, but I think my greatest accomplishment in life is that I'm fluent and that I used to stutter and 
now that I'm, you know, I didn't write anything down, but when you're a stutterer, you have to observe a lot and people are looking at you. And I went through my 20s that way when I was beautiful. I always had a stammer. Now, I mean, now you can't shut me up, you know? <laughs> and most stutterers don't like to talk. Most stutterers don't. They just, you know. So I think when I was younger, I really, you, you just, you don't know, but you, you, you're a little kid and you have to look at people. When I went on to school, when I went to nursing school, my roommates were painters. I didn't live with anybody. I never lived with, I always had artists around me. And then I picked up a camera in San Francisco. Then I picked up a camera. I went, as soon as I came out here, I knew I had I wanted a camera. And then one day I ran into Dan Weldon at a gallery opening and he said, would you like my Roloflex? And it was like, that was it. It was sort of like, and I never put it down again. And it was a very, it, and, and I took the Roloflex to India, to New Zealand, to carry a camera around in those type, it was very comfortable. And uh, I think it was just a way to express myself. And it was easy, I was a better photographer than a painter. I mean, it just, I never tried painting. So I just put all my focus into paint, into photography, and not trying to make a living off of it, that I just had to paint you, I had to photograph you. Well, that goes back to your dual career, the fact that you had your nursing and, and you, which allowed you to continue to make your artwork, right? So. It did, it, it, it has a front and a back that side. Right. There's a front and back, would I do it again, you know? That was a, Lindsay. As a therapist and on a psychological level, would you say that um, your antecedents from family were a motivating factor in your life? Did you come from a family of artists or any kind of thread that would have motivated you through your life? I, I think my, all the way I photograph, Everything I photographed probably had something to do with my childhood. I think everybody, I mean, there must be something that, you know, some sort of, you know, damage, you know, or some, <laughs> really, I mean, otherwise I would take very pretty pictures all the time, maybe, even, you know, I mean, I, I, I have a gift that I can get into different souls and I'm not doing it to, you know, for you to pay me, but it's probably, my childhood. My brother would probably tell you that too. Talk about light. About what? Light. Light. Yeah. Oh yeah, light. Light's important. <laughs> light, light. What light? Well, you know, I actually. What? Are you painting light? Am I painting light? Now that you're painting light. Is that what you said? Yes. Yes. Exactly. I mean, how do you use light in photography versus how do you use light in a painting? I'm not sure. I don't know. Yeah. All I know is is that when I take photographs with with light, I just I mean I'm pro I I photograph rather quickly, and I hold up a light meter and I measure light and that's it. It's natural light, and I've had directors that I was involved with saying, you're not even measuring light right, but you get the picture every time, but you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> but I kind of know, because again, I know how to photograph people, but I don't technically know quite right. I mean, I see people who are technically brilliant in here, you know, but it's, you know, and as far as painting goes, I'm not formally trained. You know, so I, I put up a canvas or I put up a light or I've taken some work with Michael Rausch and he's telling me to destroy your painting because you don't know what you're doing and then I redo it and then I figure it out, you know. Okay. Yeah. We have, we have, we'll do these last two questions. Sounds good. You know what, I, you know, I don't own a digital camera. 
I mean, I've had people that offered me their cameras for a really good price, but I'm so not good on the computer. I would, my dream is to have somebody just come over and take over and digitalize and handle all that. I don't, how much longer do you have in life? And I don't think I want to spend that much time on the computer. I think I'd rather just go off and photograph for a day and somehow, but I, I have a digital camera. I've taken now photographs and printed them on really beautiful Hannah Mueller paper, or I've gotten to know that and worked with that. So I'm not like, no, it can only be s silver paper. Because I, I, I have so much work that's never been printed or s seen yet. So I don't think I'm going to run off and get a digital camera unless I really take lessons. So I'm going to continue doing 12, but I'm not opposed to it. <laughs> One more. Linda, when you talk about that moment when you take a portrait, you know, that moment, you know, there's sort of a revelation or a recognition when you communicate with someone, when you push the shutter and you have that uh, kind of, you know, uh, moment of uh, when you see someone's soul or however you're perceiving that, because you see it in the photograph, so. Well, there's one of you I remember I took. <laughs> not long ago, it was like five years ago, and I pulled at the end of the road, and you were walking right by yeah, the stones, and you, you were coming out of the water, and it was just like, I have to photograph Ramesh, and I'll never photograph you again, because that's it. <laughs> <laughs> you look great, it, it, I got your essence. Yeah, that, I, I, oh, there's so many of you that aren't on the wall, I mean, we just, you know, get so many. No, but what's that moment about when, when you... I just feel that? it. I just feel it. I know it sounds cornballish. Like, oh, you're so feeling it. But it's not. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, it's not. It's like I was given some sort of gift as a child. Maybe because I couldn't talk. You know, I don't know, but I can feel things. And yet there's so many great photographers in this room. And I mean, everybody has so many different styles. And it's not like these are, you know, it's, I don't know, it's, it's an interesting feeling. Why do you click the button? Because all it is is a dumb box and a button. That when you think about it, you're not creating a work of art. You're not like painting. It's a box, light, and a button. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Are each one of these photographs like one of a full contact sheet, or is this like you're just throwing out one pitch, and if it if it lands, it lands, and if it doesn't, if it, if usually like let's say Jake, that was one photograph, maybe two. So with the roll of flex, I have twelve pictures on a roll. I'm I know I'm not being arrogant, but I always feel like I usually get one after the third, you know? And I can feel it with that person. If I'm doing a portrait, I can just feel it, and I go, okay, that's it. You know, I'm not taking any more photographs. Where you get digital, and you're, somebody's paying you, you better, you know, click that camera. <laughs> I mean, we did talk Lindsay, about Lindsay, did you want to ask me? But it, but but you. But, but, but you, it belongs to a medium format camera. Looking down into a camera versus pointing a camera at someone. I know. Can you explain how the, the, the difference. I know. It's just I don't know. I I think that I just got so used to the Roloflex by looking down, even when I was in India. You know, you're working with people and you pulled out your camera and I I, I can shoot fast. Um, if you give me a 35 millimeter now, I can do it. But I'm. I don't think about it. But it's slower, because it's a roll of flex. You gotta crank the thing, you know? <laughs> they don't believe you're doing anything. Right. Yeah. 
I think, are you saying just because the, the actual nature of the role of flex that it, it changes the way that the viewer or the subject is interacting with you? That's what you're saying. Right. Oh, yeah. Right. 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 I had one, I'm going to tell this story because I'm dying to get this off my chest. Right. And during the COVID, during COVID, I was in New York and everybody was wearing masks and I was running to an opening and I passed a guy in a wheelchair and he was balancing on his hips and I photographed him. I did not paparazzi. I walked by him. You know, it was COVID. Everything was just crazy. It was just, you know, everybody. And sure enough, I walked by him. He's sitting there with a mask on. He's in a wheelchair. I, you know, and he had on his hips, right? His hips. Walked by. There's policemen. Turned around. Walked back. And I looked at him and I said, may I photograph you? And his eyes just beamed. <laughs> And he was so happy, and I felt, and I took it. Uh, I, it was hard to look at for a long time, but I will exhibit it. But that was a personal photograph with him balancing on hip bones in the middle of Fifth Avenue and 44th Street, and people are obsessed with their life. And this guy let me photograph him with film, not digital. Again, that was a personal photograph with my life. Why I had to photograph him. So, um, yeah. but, you, but you only use that photograph to get back to Lindsay's comment. You know, that you only use that type of camera, not photograph. Sorry, you only use the roll of flex right now, right. Lindsay. I'm only oh, sorry, I went off on the totally different thing. Yes, no, I, yes, I, I only I, use that roll of flex, and maybe it is an intimate thing that I can go in contact with people. You know, maybe it is my way of, you know, but usually every photograph has something to do with me, that if that I, it, it, they're part of me. Even if you have me take your portrait, I'm gonna pick up something about you. I don't know, it's a mystery. You know, it's so personal, especially when you do a project, you're putting your soul into it. So, oh. Because, because of the roll of flex and the square negative, is that why you, you prefer the square negative as opposed to like 35 or 67? No, I don't. I don't mind. I, I don't. I just got used to the roll of flex, Jerry. I mean, I do have a whole, you know, thing of 35 millimeter when I first met you that I shot with a 35 millimeter. But now I do prefer a square negative. I mean, I'm older now, so I probably am not going to give it up, you know, unless, you know, I, I, I like the square negative. You can always crop it. I'm not anti-cropping. I, I have to say, I have a friend who's in this room, and I don't want to embarrass him, but he has seen me photograph people. He was like, you're going to ask that person, and they'll let me photograph them, you know, so that's nice. I'm so lucky. we're we're out of time uh, for this. Thank event. you for but, coming. Hold on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. so much but what I was gonna say is I have a few announcements to make and also you know you don't have to leave you can stay here talk to Linda I, I don't want to promise you like but anyway no, they, so um, tomorrow there's a creative lab at six o'clock with Linda so if you want more Linda magic come over tomorrow at six um, our next exhibition opens on March 29th it's called look alive it's curated by Ellie Duke and it's six young artists it's in response to this exhibition Anthony also, like we work really closely on this one to, to bring a new exhibition um, to in response to this exhibition. Lori Lambert talk will be on uh, April 14th, and Mark Mann, which is also associated with us, will be in conversation with a few of the dancers and Anthony. Anthony has worked with all the dancers that you see on uh, in, in that presentation over there. And this exhibition is open until Mar uh, to, until May 6th. As always, we're free. Please come back, tell all your friends, everything. Thanks again, Linda. Thank you all. Thank you.